Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. All right, we're live. We got we got some uh, nice little mixtures here, some old yeah. fashioned. What what uh what is this? On the Rocks Premium Cocktails by Knob Creek. Old fashioned. Me and Chris got the old fashions. Kurt's got the Manhattan. I don't know. Kurt raided my liquor cabinet, and uh, that's what he came up with. Pretty good. It looks like a Christmas gift for sure. Don't you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it'll work. Yeah. <laughs> it would be my first choice, but... Is it good? It's all right, yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. I don't do. It's probably not as strong as I normally do it, but, you know. I don't know if I've ever had a Manhattan, so this is... Really? Yeah. I usually like old fashions, but... It's just... Don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure that the old... Or the Manhattans just don't have the sugar and, like, the fruit in it that... Hmm. Pretty sure it's just bitters and bourbon. I won't quote you on it. Is that wrong? I don't know. Because <laughs> I remember I'd be like, I, I was talking about at home uh, making, I call them rednecked old fashions, and I was telling people what I put in it. It was just like bitters and, and bourbon or whiskey, and they're like, that's a Manhattan. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm making Manhattans. <laughs> so, I don't know. But anyways, so... I'm joined here on my back porch. This podcast is not going to go out right when we're recording this. We're recording the end of August, although it does feel like October um, out here with my brother, Kurt Martonic, Kurt the Gunsmith, and then a good buddy, mutual friend of ours, Chris Toomey. And I, I think I think Chris, cool, Chris has been on here quite a few times now, honestly. You've been on, you were on in the very early days, first year of the podcast, elk hunting with me and my dad when we used to do the day-by-day -day hunt trips. Yep, broadcasting um, live from Yeah, and that was actually like... Oops, when, should I say that? No, you oh. shouldn't say that. All right, sorry. Editors, cut that out, yeah. please. Thank <laughs> bleep, you. Bleep that. Jamie. <laughs> yeah. Jamie. We'll, we'll bleep uh, that. Cut that out. Um, yeah. Anyways, we, we had met on the mountain. That was the first time we actually met in person, wasn't it? Oddly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just think it back to it. that was 2018. Yep. Um, so we met each other and uh, elk hunting, and you came and met. That's when you met my dad too. I forgot about that. I think so. Yeah, because he was there with me. It was his first time or second time elk hunting, and then. Uh, but did we meet because of Johnny, or did we just meet like through like social media or other mutual friends? I don't remember. I, I remember it as you guys met through Johnny. Yeah, probably so. Okay, probably so. But we have interesting, like, aligned backgrounds, which is strange that we never did meet up prior to that. Yeah. But I think Johnny, maybe. Maybe so. Yeah, because we were both safety professions and yeah. from Slippery Rock University. Yep, yep. Um, so we both had that kind of aligned there. But you were, just, you know, you, you you knew the, the Johnny Stewart, you know, way back in the day. Yeah, he was my next door neighbor. <laughs> yeah. My whole life. <laughs> Man, I... I, I got to have Johnny tell the story because he'll probably tell it better than I do. But the story of when you and your brother would come home from college and you didn't live there anymore, but you wanted to stay there. So you'd stay at Johnny's house. Yeah. Is that how that went? We'll probably have to reserve all the details. But uh, yeah, basically we would uh, spend, <laughs> spend some nights at Johnny's rather than go back to the parents' house, right? Well, John, you know, Johnny, yeah, how he tells the story, it's hilarious. Oh, he's like, my God. He's like, I locked the doors so the Toomeys couldn't get in at night. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, because they, you know, he's like, they, they, he goes, I had to work in the morning and they're just up partying all night. And he's like, so they come in, they come in, to, he goes, he goes, one night I felt a foot on my chest while I'm sleeping. <laughs> and he's like, my brother's coming in. Yeah, the window. he was like, Chris's brother. Just open my window and crawl and he goes, hey, Johnny, your door was locked. You, you know, you accidentally locked the doors. He's like, oh, it was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, he tells that one all the time. Oh, yeah. I, yeah I've heard it about 10 times, but it's great every yeah. time he tells it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's a, that's a good crew. I've got to meet a bunch of the people I grew up around you guys through Johnny's camp and stuff. Every, every, I just roll around the ground laughing. That's for sure. Too funny he is, man. But then you were on again. Um for the Miriam's Turkey episode. Yep. And were you on again after that, or was that the last time? I think so. I, I don't I don't remember, Bo. Maybe I think that was it. Yeah, I think were, were yeah. Were you on again? Or 
I don't. I don't know. I don't. Yeah, maybe. Don't two, maybe just two times. I don't know, Bo. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I. I couldn't remember the exact details, but I remember that. Yeah. Obviously, you were on a few different times there, but uh, you know, we've we've become buddies for you know since really 2018 during that yeah. time, and then Kurt had moved out to Colorado, and and then you guys had met there and became you know best yeah. buddies. Yeah, yeah. We we pretty much every weekend camp together or whatever and which was going to lead into what our conversation goes into today but yeah. yeah it was uh we had a good time yeah a lot of a lot of a lot of truck camping uh every single weekend huh yeah, yeah. lots lots of fishing yep yeah that, which is, is just funny that how that worked out and then you know kurt moved to montana and you guys were still in colorado and then you guys, everybody moved back home. Everybody moved home. Yeah, everybody right. moved back so to Pennsylvania. Here. So here we are. Here we are yeah. <laughs> in Pennsylvania together, which is yeah. is pretty it's good. wild. It's to think good about. to be back. All of us. Chris is one of he's uh he holds a weird spot in my life where uh, he's one of those friends of mine that has broke all these different spectrums for me. For example, like I've lived, I had a military life, I had a life in Colorado, a life in Montana, like all these different friend groups, but somehow, and the one here, obviously. And somehow Chris has broken all those spectrums, ex- except the uh, initial military one. But it's kind of like a, it's kind of weird in a sense because you're used to seeing like one friend group in one area. Yeah. And Chris just always would pop up. But we were both boom. We were both in the airy fueling yeah. business. Yep. So we were. We had a lot of talk. You to were talk the about Pittsburgh there. wing, and I was. Yeah, that was another weird thing when I met him. It was an immediate, real like, connector. Is uh, I'm like, oh, you guys probably never heard of it. I was a boom operator in flight refueling, and your Kate, your wife's like. My brother's a boom. And then there's only like 500 of us or something like that in the whole Air Force. So it was like, I was like, really? What's his name? I didn't know him. But then he was a machinist working on the 135s and everything. So, yeah. Yeah. oh, really? Yeah. 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 I didn't. Okay. I Maybe I did know that, but I didn't know. I knew you were in the military, but I didn't know that's kind of what you had done. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Huh. That's cool. But, anyways, I, I wanted to do this podcast with both of you guys. I couldn't think of better people I, I don't have that many friends apparently that are are pretty good or like has had a lot of experience i guess truck camping and that goes anywhere from you know fly fishing trips that goes anywhere from hunting trips out west white tail hunts out of state whatever you know when chris you and i have talked a lot about like gear and stuff for all ty- types of camping um, which I have a video I still haven't put out yet that you had sent for me of like your backcountry hunting setup. Um, everybody should laugh about this, but like when you see the videos I have, sometimes they come out late. Like uh, I just released a video of my buddy Kenny on logging cuts. We recorded that a year and a half ago. I just got around <laughs> to, to editing it. I, I prioritize an XQ. I'm basically Jocko, but i um, just kidding. But I, But anyways, so we've talked a lot about, you know, gear but also just like the styles of it and when you have a lot of experience doing these types of things you start finding what works for you and what doesn't i really don't think there's one right or wrong way and it's funny because all three of us have a different style of how we truck camp and like to do that on hunts and i think it'd be kind of unique to to talk about a little bit yeah for sure um i kind of want to start it out with like chris kind of talking about your background when you started getting into like you know, whether it be hunting or if it was fishing or whatever, but talk about like your experience with the beginning of going camping essentially. So that goes way back. So, I mean, we, we were doing standard like tent camping as kids and I always had a passion for, you know, just being outside. But I think where the truck camping journey really happened was when I moved out West and there was like an evolution of different types of truck camping, really, I mean, completely based on just budgetary reasons. You know, I started off with like a simple canvas, what they called a uh, uh, soft topper. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of like a, a collapsible type uh, cap, cap, cap yeah. if you will, or a topper. And then we quickly grew out of that because it didn't have a lot of space. I mean, it worked fine. But then, you know, when COVID came around, my wife and I, you know, we got on Marketplace and we were really interested in upgrading to like an actual truck camper, like the old school slide in type camper. And uh, we actually found one for a couple thousand bucks and remodeled it. So that was like a COVID project and, and, and really made it nice inside. 
Um, but you know, some of those like older style slide in campers, uh, can be kind of heavy on a truck. Um, so then the next evolution was like a newer upgraded model of a, of a truck camper, like a four wheel camper is the brand that we use. Yep. And, uh, you know, it kind of grew out of that because it took up our truck bed and our like utilitarian use of a pickup truck. Cause it's like, you know, a man door into the camper. And then finally, lastly, where we're at now is it's another four wheel camper type brand, but it actually sits on top of the bed rails like a topper, but pops up vertically, um, similar to the configuration that you run. So it has been like a wild evolution of truck camping, but we really kind of over the years found out what we like and landed on a product that we can camp in, but still use the truck bed type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Those four wheel campers, like the, the one year second evolution that you had where you go in and it's got like, like walking into a camper essentially, but in a truck bed. And, uh, John Barclow has one four wheel camper and another guy, when I was just out in Utah, had the same thing in their truck beds yep. and they were running it and like it a lot where I saw the problem with it is kind of what you said is you can't really use it as a truck bed um, it. when it's in there. And you probably need some help to be able to get it out. Yeah. So it, it, it's kind of an event to get it out of your truck bed just for like listener sakes. Like these things have uh, jack uh, mounts on all four corners. So you can like jack up the camper and drive out from underneath of it. But it's kind of like an event. It's not something mm. you want to do all the time. Um, but yeah, you're pretty much all in once you put that thing in there, it's not really a truck anymore. Uh, but I can tell you like the benefit side of that is it's completely laid out with amenities. Yeah. It's, it's pretty luxurious setup. Yeah. No, I haven't, I don't think I've checked out your newest model yet. I saw it on the back of your truck and honestly, I just thought it was when we were at the Longbeard Invitational, uh, uh, party there i i just thought it was the same one you had had and then i think you showed me pictures of it and stuff and we'll we'll get some video and stuff to overlay it and some of the clips and stuff that go along this podcast sure. so you can be able to see it but um yeah it's just super interesting to be able to to see that style of it and i like the idea how yours is now you can kind of you use it as a truck bed yeah totally. um yep. but then it pops up to be able to have the sleeping quarters and everything but it doesn't like have you know, like bent, like nice bench seating or like the cooktop and the fridge and the solar panels. And it, it's very basic in nature, like a cap. But the benefit is it still pops up, still has. You still throw a deer in it. Still throw the deer in it. Yeah, I got the deck system in it. So okay, um, that's where I keep a lot of the the camping stuff that we can talk about eventually. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. What about you, Kurt? What's kind of been like your evolution with Car camping, your style for sleeping, like your vehicle, everything. Uh, from right, I mean, right from the get go. I mean, sleeping in the vehicle was just kind of just did it. But it really changed. My evolution changed when uh, my wife Abby started going with me. Because once you add another person to that, that adds not twice the amount of gear, but a lot of it. Um, and kind of how I ended up building my system, which I'll get into later was so that I could make it, because she didn't come with me all the time. But anyways, all of my camping has been out of my daily driver, which is a Toyota 4Runner. So it's not like I don't have a ton of space. I'm very limited, and i got to kind of keep it keep that in mind when I'm doing it. And it's got to be able to convert fast, because if you have any major steps to want to go camping, you're going to talk yourself out of it. you got to kind of make it super easy and super quick to go to use. But Colorado is really... I mean, we were doing it when we were in New Jersey. We would come up to Pennsylvania and camp. Um, but Colorado is where I really got my system dialed in because we were living in Lakewood, which is like a Denver suburb, but uh, very crowded, didn't have a yard or anything like that. So every weekend we camped. And that was, but in, depending on what time we both got out of work, it was load the vehicle up, load the dog up, go. And uh, adding a dog also adds some com complexities because <laughs> yeah. it went from, me and Abby sleeping next to each other in the back of the forerunner with a simple mattress pad and two sleeping bags to you had a 70 pound dog into the mix and she wants to sleep where your pillows are. It's like, it's just too much for a forerunner. <laughs> but, yeah. And what, what year forerunner do you have? It's a 2008. So a fourth gen. Okay. Gotcha. No. And I guess, and, and then also, okay. So explain kind of where you went from there. Like as far as you still sleeping in the vehicle. Oh or? yeah. So we went from, 
we tried a couple different things. First was sleep in the vehicle, obviously. Next, we just had a simple two-person tent. Then we went to a four-person for the dogs. Um, that was okay. It worked. You can still do it, but like, I'm a gearhead, so I just wanted more. I went to, I put an awning on the side of the Forerunner, and then I had one of the ARB tent attachments to the awning. So like four sidewalls. It was awesome. The only thing it sucked with was wind. And where we were camping a lot in those high basins and everything, the wind was bad. So it wasn't like, it wasn't very comfortable. You thought it was going to go down a lot when it was windy. Um, the other downside of it is like when we'd go with trips with Chris and Kate, uh, you couldn't keep it at your campsite. So like every time you had to use your vehicle, you had to take down all of your camp, you know? So it was great to have like later when we'd use a tent and that it was awesome because then we could, we didn't have like, that would be our cook set up right next to the vehicle. But, uh, yeah, you had to take everything down to, to move your vehicle. Um, so then we evolved further when we got into Montana, we started making that transition in Colorado, but when we got to Montana, I picked up a, a small eight by 10 or might no a six by eight wall tent. So a real small three foot side walls, an old canvas handmade one that my buddy had picked up at a yard sale that I then I bought it off him. Um, has the galvanized metal frame and wood stove and everything, and that's what we kind of settled on, and that's where we're at now. And that worked really well for out west. I don't know how well it'll work here uh, with the floorless and everything, because out there it's like you don't deal with as much bugs. Everything's a lot drier, um, so I don't know how well that'll work here. I think it, I think we'll make it work, but um, that wall tent setup was. I mean, I uh, think's cozy. Oh my god! Especially you know the wood stove and like we had it set up so that it was just no matter what. I mean, in, a forerunner's limited. So also like I'm not just limited to having my the back of my forerunner, but now we have two dogs, which take up. So we had to keep the seats up. So now I'm limited to that little bit of space behind the back seats and what's in front of the back seats on the floor. And we we did have a big dry, Cabela's dry bag. Uh, that we put on the roof rack, but and if we were hunting, we'd put a cooler on the tra- trailer hitch rack. But for limited space, it was an awesome setup, super comfortable, yeah. And everybody was happy. I remember when we were bear hunting last year, and I killed my bear. You showed up. Well, you were there at the beginning, and then you came that last weekend after you got out of work, and we got dumped on with like a foot and a half of snow. And I remember I was in that seek outside courthouse wall tent, which is a cool wall, wall tent because it's super light and packable. But it did not do well with wind, and it didn't do well with a lot of snow, and it sagged a lot and had problems. You were in that canvas thing with the wood stove in there. When you go inside it, it just it was very small, but it was just like cozy. cozy like you yeah. felt like you were almost in a cabin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I think that's a really cool design for people doing like out of state uh rut hunts and stuff that is in colder weather you yeah. know you'd be able to run that wood stove and be able to have it and we'll we'll get a little bit more into kind of like the strategy on things here in a minute but i want to run through um kind of my evolution and setup so i started with i started with just like popping up a tent outside a vehicle when i you know that's how i kind of started with some of the out of state trips i'd do or camping trips and then i bought after I sold my old Jeep Cherokee that really couldn't go that far anyways, um, which that wasn't very big in the back, so it was hard to lay in it. You had to lay a diagonal, and you couldn't fit all your gear. Then I bought a Dodge Ram, and I, the Ram Bourbon, and I had a six-and-a-half-foot bed on it, and I put a cap on it that I had color match painted to it, and I just throw a mattress in the back, which worked great, except yeah. for I had to take all my gear out all the time to be able to sleep in it. Sure. And... Yeah, and it just was kind of a pain in the butt. It doesn't sound like it, but when you're in the moment and you have to get up and go hunting, you don't want to take all your totes, throw them back in there, you know, move your mattress around. Sometimes, you know, you either have to throw stuff on top of it or deflate it, and it was just kind of a pain in the butt uh, to do day after day after day. And then I went from that to when I bought my Chevy, I put a cap on it again, I put a deck system in, and then I got my first rooftop tent. Uh, James Brood uh, Evasion rooftop tent, and I got that used, and it was awesome. I mean, a lo- that cha- rooftop tents changed the whole game for me as far as like level comfort. I'm sure what you have, Chris, might even be you know a step above, but like having that ability, and I kind of used to make fun of people that had rooftop tents on their vehicle, like what are you using that for? But 
man, you go and pop that thing up in a matter of a couple minutes and be able to sleep in it and have a nice pad. It was super nice. What I didn't, that system was actually really great for specifically hunting, having the deck system in there, having the, the cap on it and the rooftop tent. But what I didn't like about it was for the other parts of the year, it wasn't ideal as far as the space things to, to do quote unquote truck stuff. So that's, you know, that's when I eventually took the cap off and I put a diamond back cover on. So I keep all my gear secure, waterproof, locked underneath it. And then I put Yakima overhaul HD bars on top of it. And then the rooftop tent, you can still put your coolers and stuff underneath it that don't really care about the weather. And you can throw that stuff up there or just a waterproof bag and, and, have it uh, tied down essentially. But that was nice because I could pull that tent off pretty quick and then use my truck as a truck for the truck bed. And and that's kind of what I went when I just recently bought uh, a Toyota Tundra after the old heavy Chevy took a shit for lack of better terms. And, um, and uh, that was what I had put on it again, the Diamondback, the Acoma bars and then but I I upgraded my rooftop tent to a completely made in the USA Go Fast Campers uh rooftop tent V2 which is actually made for forerunners. It's the exact length of a forerunner roof. It's not typically done for trucks, but I like it. It's super long. It it folds up and is it what you call clamshell design? Clamshell, yeah. Kind of goes up, but I can put that thing up in 30 seconds and take it down in two minutes by myself, which was even quicker than I could do with my James Baroud. And I love that that ability to be able to do it. The rooftop tent things worked really well for me. Now, where I'll say some of the negatives with my setup is, and I also bought that awning off of Kurt in the room, which I haven't installed yet, but I plan on using at least the awning. I'm not sure about the room as much. But where the problem with that is is, you have to tear everything down every day to go move your truck to go camp. And and Chris and I will talk about this, but when you don't have an external tent, you lose your camping spot. It's your placeholder. That's your placeholder. That's right. And so that's that's kind of a thing. And I'm actually getting a um, a local fab shop that, that I'm buddies with is building um, an off-road trailer for me that I can use and put my rooftop tent on and everything and, and have that so I can park that and be able to, to like have that as my mobile, you know, setup. And then you pull in somewhere and then just go the, what you, what you get with a trailer though, is you have an extra, you know, how many feet to, to transport and yeah. maneuverability, which this trailers has, you know, 33 inch tires and independent axles. And it's pretty freaking sick um so i'm excited to to get to try that out but that's kind of been my evolution with it oh one thing that that made me think of too is uh with like having to tear down your system one of the things that really really bothered me about having that awning set up is that i was constantly thinking like what if something happens where there's an emergency i need to use my vehicle right now like i because that would take me like 10 or 15 minutes to put everything away like, and that's yeah. the room and everything. And like the way I was thinking of it, I was like, I'm just going to run a knife down the end of that, cut it off and go. But like that b- bothered me. And that was a, that is a benefit of having something that's separate from your vehicle. Sure. Is if you do need it in something like that, where it is a very time sensitive thing, Yep. you can just get in and go. But. So I think, I think what we just talked about, the way they categorize that is camp in what I'm doing camp on what you're doing and then camp out what Kirk's doing. So that's like the, the, the three categories of truck camping, camp in, camp on, camp out. Yeah. And they all have plus and minuses, right? Like we all kind of described. So, yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. And I think it all comes down to the specific person and what, what you're looking to do, what you're looking to do. Like, for example, what I was saying, like, I like to use my truck for truck stuff and that's, you know, I just like to say that I'm not actually doing anything cool, but, <laughs> but you know, if you need a whole anything, you need to pick up a couch, you need to do whatever, like a lawnmower, like being able to use it. Like that's, I like that ability to have the modular approach, but you lose, you lose a little bit with that, that approach specifically. Um, but they, they all have their, yeah, they all have their plus and minuses is I guess what we're getting at here. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is that it's, it's, it's trending right now. But this has been going on since the 1970s. Oh yeah, like truck before truck, that. Truck, I mean, I, 
Yeah, I mean the station wagon days, you know. Well, like truck campers, you see, oh, yeah. like, like the old seventy nine F one fifty with like a like an old truck. Camper. Yeah. So it's just really gaining in popularity. I think post COVID, it like you know people getting out trying to stay mobile. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's yeah. You're you're exactly right. And I, I don't know. I geek out on it too. Oh, like, absolutely. I love like building a system and making it work, and that's why like. Anybody that's been listening to my stuff for a long time, I was like super against buying a brand new vehicle and I still don't know if I'm a fan of it, but I, I kind of came down, it came down to a point where the, the used market to have a reliable vehicle to be able to travel me across the country was ridiculous. And, you know, for a few thousand dollars more, essentially I could be in a brand new vehicle, but I was like strategic on what I wanted to buy. And Kurt's been a big Toyota fan and I'm not sitting here at stroking Toyota because I haven't used one long enough. But anyway, I talked to is like Toyota's a reliable vehicle kind of built for off road, not meant for hauling a lot. Like one thing I need to do is install airbags on the back of my truck. Cause when I put heavy stuff in there, it sags, it yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. look like a, a city selector driving around with it, you know, dropping in the back and high in the front. And I don't love that, but I need to, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, but anyways, so I, I wanted to build this truck out, you know, for the best I could with the budget. Cause you can go crazy with it, you know? So like for me, it was like, what I wanted to do was something that had ground clearance that I could go places, not so high that I can't get in a lot of places or overhanging trees is a problem, you know, that. So I was like, put a three inch lift on it. 35 inch BFG all terrains that were good, you know, on the road. I've had these tires on my last truck and then also off-road and then you know put some skid plates because i i use it and and i end up going white in color so it doesn't show scratches as bad because i just beat the living hell out of it in west virginia already but like just going through a bunch of crap but i wanted to build something that was capable of going places. the last thing i want and this isn't this is a topic for a different conversation but as a winch because i've always wanted a winch since i was a kid yeah yeah you need that's pretty cool do you have a winch i don't not on my truck no there are times in Colorado where I wish I had a winch. Yeah. I have like and I other felt a lot better if I did recovery methods. But mm-hmm. I think what you're saying though, Bo, is important. Like because like listeners might be thinking, why are we harping on this topic of like truck camping? There's just like huge like we're we're one segment of camping, right? The truck camping world. But just to kind of frame up what we're talking about, there's this massive spectrum of camping, of tent camping all the way to like class A motorhomes. And what you're referring to is like why we're all interested in this is because of like mobility. Like with tent camping, you lose all this comfort. Um, it's very mobile, but with like with motorhomes, they're not mobile at all. Like trying to get like a motorhome yeah. into a trailhead, not but, gonna... they're, but they're super comfortable, right? Yeah. So we find this like uh, inverse correlation where we find ourselves right in the middle of this X of mobility and comfort, right? So we can four wheel back into the BLM and have a comfortable setup. And that's really why we're focusing on like this. Yeah. It's like truck camping, right? No, that's a good point to kind of define the why, because like, and, and the thing is, you know, and there, you can totally do it by just tossing up a bivy underneath yes. your truck if you wanted to and camp and do that. But I'm going to be honest, like I, the more hunting I do and the older I get, some luxuries are kind of nice to have. When you you're have doing to keep, that camping fun yeah. like i get it if you want to be like i can i i because i looked at getting one of those uh, i think they're called canvas cutters for a little bit yeah and i was like oh that's awesome but i'm like like what do i do when it rains and i want to cook dinner <laughs> yeah <laughs> like what, yeah. just stand out in the rain and act tough and be miserable like and we use these things for everything yeah, like, yeah. i mean i use it year round for fly fishing kayaking i mean mountain biking whatever uh, we're we're using that as like we said the vessel for adventure, the vessel for the adventure. vessel for adventure. We talked about this earlier. Yeah, yeah. the vest the vessel. I know, for... but I wasn't letting everybody know we talked about it. I was acting like you just came up with it. Oh, off you wanted the to, Oh, sorry. Cut, yeah, cut that out. And yeah. it. <laughs> no, so this so no like in reality like yeah we're using it for hunting, but it could we could be pulled over on the side of the road up here on the creek we were just looking at and and spend the weekend there, you know. Yeah. So yeah. being comfortable is important. We don't have to sleep in a tent, you know. Yeah. yeah, and also if you're if you have a family and you're trying to take, you know, your family out and stuff, adding some creature comforts sure. is kind of nice. And and I'll, and I'll be honest like there's one thing like 
camping in the summertime is one thing. You know, you deal with heat, you deal with bugs, you can, but you can get away with a little bit less. You start doing some hunts in November, whether it's out west in the mountains or it's on a DIY rut hunt that you're going out of state to Ohio or wherever. Having some, you know, comforts after you're hunting in 30 degree weather all day to come back and have a setup that makes you feel comfortable and and almost you know it's not home but it, you know gives you a little bit of that that feeling it fe- makes you feel good you know like last year in in west virginia i went down and hunted the rut by myself and i set up my wall tent my that courthouse i was telling you about and uh and it was just like you know i brought a cot you know versus sleeping on the coal mine rocky ground and doing that which was nice um but what i learned there was i had and this is I just didn't think in the East Coast you'd have the winds like you do out West, but we got like 50 mile per hour winds and I ended up blowing the tent half over um, on myself. And this Kurt remembers the story, so he's probably laughing, but the stove pipe uh, pulled out of my stove because the winds were so bad and uh, ripped a hole in the tent in, and West, Virginia? The, in West Virginia and uh, and and it filled my tent with smoke. Luckily, it was going out because I don't ever run the stove while I'm sleeping because I just worry about those things. And I was just getting ready for bed, and I was like holding down the tent. And I got up. I finally got it, everything in place. And uh, then I just jumped up in my rooftop tent and slept the rest of the day because I knew that <laughs> yeah. wasn't oh, knew yeah. that wasn't going anywhere. Yeah. Um. But the reason why I had set had set that up was because I was driving to different spots to hunt, and I just. And I also wanted the wood stove. Wood stoves are pretty freaking nice on yeah, cold, wood cold weather hunts. Yeah, yeah. To to be able to do, but um, you know, we've kind of talked about a lot of the different types of you know ways to sleep and do everything. But I'm kind of interested to hear in like your setups on things you're bringing, how you're organizing it, and going through it. I think maybe Kurt, let's start with you because you have a pretty dialed system. Yeah, I, I know for sure. I um I love my system too. So like. It has been through a lot of iterations, but I think it's near its end. It'll never be at its end because I always want to improve it incrementally. But the uh, one of the things I'll say, too, is nothing that I do has made any permanent modification to my vehicle. So my vehicle is still normal, and this means that anybody with any SUV, truck, whatever, can adapt this type of thing. But uh, a couple things that I had to take into consideration, like I mentioned earlier, family. So wife, dogs. Sometimes all of them, sometimes just wife, sometimes just a, one dog, depending on whether we're bird hunting, whether she can get off work, all that kind of stuff. So I had to make my system like it has to be adaptable for what I'm doing because sometimes like if it's just me and Sage going out bird hunting, sometimes I don't want to set the wall tent up. Me and her just sleep in the back of the forerunner. Or if it's me by myself, I'll do that because it's like just one less headache, less gear, all that kind of stuff, less preparation. Um, so all of it has to go in there so that gave me a couple different setups so i have like and i mentioned it earlier if you have if you have to think too much or do too much before you go camping you're not going to want to do it so you everything has to be quick um i have a toiletries like little box little tote this big i have a cook tote that's probably this big and i have a give some like uh relative dimensions for the people that aren't watching it oh so so um, the toiletries one's probably like a 14, 16 inches long, maybe eight inches wide by six inches tall. The cook one is smaller than, it's one of the Walmart Rubbermaid, uh, small totes. So it's like, I don't know, maybe 12 inches tall by 20 by 16. I don't know what the actual dimensions are, but not very big. Um, just has what you need in it. And I'll get into what, what's in each one. And then I have sleep system like shelter right so and with that it's separated into two things i have an old my old army a bag or my air force air a bag that has sleeping bag sleeping pad which i use a big memory foam thing that's cut in half my wife has one side i have the other we both have our own little bags and then my pillow so no matter what if i grab that bag i know i at least have a pad sleeping bag and a pillow um and usually if I'm going to my vehicle, then that's all I need. If I'm going to be in the wall tent, I grab my cot too. So one extra thing. Um, and if she's going, she grabs her cot and she grabs her bag. The toiletries bag, that has deodorant, toothpaste, all of your first aid stuff. So ibuprofen, Benadryl, uh, wet wipes, toothbrush, toothpaste, I think I said. All that kind of stuff. Sunscreen, bug spray, all that. The stuff that you would forget because like, 
I can't imagine anymore going camping and trying to think of every little thing. It could just would blow my mind, and I'd probably talk myself out of it. And then my cook setup has it's a Stanley Stanley cook set. I can't recommend it enough, but it has all the pots nest inside of it. There's a frying pan, saucepan, and then like a big boil pot. So you can do everything from frying steaks to doing chili. I have an Everest camp stove. By Camp Chef. Yeah, by Camp Chef. So that that one's separate. That is a separate thing you have to grab, but it's pretty, you remember that pretty easily. But inside that cook tote, I have the adapter to hook it up to that stove. I have two propane tanks, one that's hooked up to it. I have a thing of crazy salt for seasoning, because that's pretty much all we use. I had tried carrying a bunch of stuff, and only one we ever use is crazy salt. Um, we have our sporks extra in case we're camping with somebody else that doesn't have uh forks and spoons like i've tried the actual plates and i'd like to cut down on garbage and stuff but there's nothing that beats a stack of paper plates and just burning it yeah it's a fire starter too and yeah and then you burn it when you're done if you can have a fire because we dealt with that a lot with fire fire restrictions out west so you couldn't have a fire um but that was so i'm trying to think if there's anything else in there that i needed to touch on Oh, cutting board and a knife. But other than that, it was pretty simple. Gloves to grab the pot and pan. Lighters. Have lighters everywhere because you're going to forget them and you're going to need them. But whenever we decide to go camping, because a lot of the times it would be, especially in Colorado, Chris would text me. like He'd drop me a coordinate and he'd say, hey, we're going to be here in three hours. You in? And I'd be like, I'd look at Abby and I said, hey, you want to go camping tonight? She's like, yeah. I was like, yeah, we'll be there. And it's two and a half hours away. And we'd still make the time because we'd just grab everything, throw it in the vehicle, and and go. Um, the Having that kind of set up, so no matter what I did, if I take the wall tent, that was good to go. Um, if I wanted to put the wood stove in the wall tent, all the piping for the wood stove, lighters, kindling wood. Every time I got back from uh, a trip, I'd refill it with kindling. But all I had to do was grab that stove. It was a heavy like sportsman guide one, nothing special. But all I had to do was grab that, and I had everything I needed to start a fire. And I had all the parts and pieces, everything. So I didn't have to think about it. Um, but that system was very adaptable. I could go between whether I'm sleeping by myself in the vehicle, setting the wall tent up for just me and the dog, or setting the wall tent up for both dogs and me and Abby. And one of the things that people don't think about a lot, I don't think unless you do it a lot, is how you pack it in your vehicle and how you unpack it. Like, me and Abby have such a system camping, um, and I wrote about it in a recent article I did for Free Range American on our antelope hunt, but when we pull into a camping spot, it's like we don't have to, we don't even really have to talk about like, hey, grab that, grab, like it's just, we know what's going on. We know how the stuff that we need first is on the top, like the tent poles and the frame are on top of everything. Sleep mags and all that are the very bottom because that's, everything's got to be unpacked before we got to, like, cots are on top of the sleeping bags because that's got to get set up before you grab your sleeping bags and a lot the way i think about that now the way that's kind of evolved is because you only set up camp so many times in the rain and spread your stuff out and get it wet before you realize you need a better system you know yeah so like once you have the tent up then everything else can start coming out and it's going to start staying dry but little things like that after doing it so much um i don't know i think last year me and abby spent it was like eight or nine weekends. So what's that? I want 20 to 30 days in the wall tent, like 20 to 30 nights in the wall tent. So it was like, we got a lot of experience doing it and it was every different weather condition from us bear hunting or we got a foot of snow to being a hundred degrees out in the plains hunting sharp tail. So it was like, yeah, but our system worked for all of it. Yeah. And I, I've learned a lot from you because you had you know i've done it a decent amount but mine's very certain seasonal i guess that i was doing it in the past and and a lot and it was just like i didn't have a really good system i didn't have that tote that you're talking about that had everything in it and i was just like i had a list that was decent but i had to find everything i spent (laughs) half a day trying to go through my house and garage finding all the things i needed and i'd have to pull it from different stuff that I'd use it for here and crossovers. And I understand like depending on budget, you can't have two of certain things, but if you can, that makes a whole nother world. Like everything is like, this is my truck camping gear yeah. and having that ready. Cause I learned a lot from that because like you said, you said it multiple times. 
if you don't have it, if you don't make it easy, you're not going to do it. Like, you're, in having that system, your checklist goes from having 40 things to grab to having three, four items. And yeah. another thing, I last thing I'll add about in this go, is in reference to food, and I actually learned this from Chris, is we had a running list on our phone, on our notes pad, that had what we'd get at the grocery store if we were going camping, like what we would get on our way out. And we had like a couple, we had a couple standard like menu items, I guess you would call it. Sure. sure. So that like when we would go to leave, and we're like, okay, we got to stop by the grocery store and head on our way out. And our routine was always dinner for the first night. We'd get Jimmy John's on the way up Evergreen. Uh, Rob's, Rob's place. place, yeah. We'd get Jimmy John's on the way out, and that's what we'd eat that first night. So we could cut down on cooking. And then we'd, but we'd pick up like a dozen eggs. We'd pick up some of the old jalapeno hot dog, jalapeno cheese hot dogs. Yep. Uh, instead of buns, because they crush, we'd grab little wraps. Like just, but having a little list on our phone. So even the grocery store, we didn't have to waste time and think about it. We could stop in there and it was like three or four minutes, basic items. Oh, and in that cooked oat, you had your, like your cooking oil and everything too. So that was one last thing you could forget. Mm-hmm. But that was something I picked up from you. The food, food one. Glad I made an influence on you, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, no, that that um, the food thing, the food thing's interesting. Um, just to put a point on that is because if you ever try to go camping, especially when you go to a group of people, it's like, oh, what do you want for food? I don't care. What do you want? It's like, oh my gosh, it's like this thing. And what I've also learned, especially on hunts, more so than specific camping trips, is a lot of times you get back at night, you don't want to spend all this time cooking and not at all sometimes you do yeah. but most of the time you don't and so it was like i i've looked at it especially on hunts i'll take a mix i'll have dehydrated meals so i'll have like my heather's choice meals um that i'll have that i can have quick and easy or i was just talking to a guy and man i can't i think it might have been ryan elder a guy that i had talked to a while back he had sent me a mountain buck monday submission but he's from north carolina and i just met him and he was i'm gonna get him on the podcast but he was talking about when he goes on out-of-state hunts where he'll make meals freeze them in the bags and then take it and they just need to put it in the boiling water and it and turns into food and that's a really good option so you don't have to break out the camp chef and dirty dishes essentially and and go through that so that was a really really cool option but I, i try to make it easy like i still I, like for me, I prioritize. I love bacon and eggs. I like yeah. making breakfast. So like I'll have enough where I can do that half the time, you know, because there's some mornings you get up and you're tired already and you got low sleep. But you don't want to cook. Mm-hmm. So you might, you know, choose for the dehydrated meals or some bars or whatever to be able to do it. But no, I think that's. And that's if you're going good. with a group, we always did this. It was like, hey, you guys got tomorrow's dinner. We got tonight's. Yeah. Just be straightforward. Yeah. About and, it. and then like we got today, we got t- Tonight for dinner and tomorrow for breakfast, you guys got Saturday night dinner, That's Sunday saves. breakfast. Because, like, people want to be generous all the time, and you buy double of everything, you know. So it's good if you're camping with people just to say, hey, if you guys yeah. do this, we do that. Save some money. Yeah. Makes and it one, one cook stove set up. Yeah, like, yeah. Just simplifies everything. Sure. Yeah. No, that... Um... I, I think, yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. Yeah, you can share gear as far as that goes. And honestly, after Kurt seeing your... Your camp chef, your Everest, your two burner stove. That's what kind of got me. Um, that's what I ended up buying. But I bought the, oh man, I don't remember the specific model, but y- if you look it up, you'll be able to find it. But it's a camp chef where half of it's a griddle because I like doing eggs and bacon on that kind of style. And then, then there's a one burner on the other side. Yeah. And uh, that's a pretty nice setup. I've only used it twice now. Um, so I don't have a ton of experience with it. Kurt was with me the first time that we did it and to be able to do it and and you know i traditionally i carry a couple different spices like for my like i try to keep it simple but like i i really like that new stuff they're actually a, a partner of the podcast now but better backstrap makes the seasoning for venison stuff and honestly i use it for eggs bacon i, I do it every day like their garlic the gun seasoned garlic i just pour that on it and do it like <laughs> yeah. oh it's freaking great yeah you can't be garlic with anything it's just always good <laughs> but like something that has some salt pepper and maybe a little bit of extra spice to it that sure. seems to yeah. keep it keep it kind of simple as far as that goes anything else kurt you want to add there yeah one last thing for the cook cook kit and i thought of just thought of this but we always kept a pound of coffee in there because that was something we'd always forget. 
and we we had a little stainless steel percolator in there as well. But like always, that because coffee is that's gonna make your trip if you're a coffee drinker. We had tea bags in there stuff too, but like just have a spare bag of coffee that sits in there all summer, so that you don't have to think about that when you're going out the door too. But did you um uh what was I gonna ask you about? Oh, and the other thing, the the thing that I think that. Okay, maybe I'm speaking just for myself, but when you come home, you got to make sure you restock those things and know you're out because <laughs> otherwise you come home like me, I come home from camp and I'm like, Ugh, I don't want to do anything more with it. You know, you just kind of yeah shove it in the corner for sort sure. of deal. But I think there's something to be said by spending 30 minutes and either making a list of what you need um, and restocking it right away before you put it all the way away. If you have it at home and just restocking it, but that's, I, I think that's kind of important. Deal. What's your philosophy on that kurt we always set up everything so it would last the whole year like when i have say when i say i have seasoning in my my cook tote it's a a thing like that size that i mean it's like three years old now it's probably not good but we still use it um so yeah it's it was always one of those things the first camping trip of the season is when we'd kind of check everything and restock it but coming home another good point is when you have those systems it's super easy to like we only had to bring the cook tote back inside because that was the only one that needed cleaned you just clean the pots and pans real quick, stack them back together, and in a half hour, you're less than that, actually. You're good to go. Yeah. But keeping your, I mean, obviously, we each had a clothing bag, you know, and that took longer to pack than anything else. And sometimes it's only like two or three T-shirts and whatever. But, yeah, try to keep it so that you don't have to worry about restocking it. Yeah. That's what I would say. That's why I say a pound of coffee. That's going to last you many camping trips. Yeah. What about you, Chris? What's your kind of setup look like for your gear and how you're taking it? It's, it's, Kurt and I are kind of cut from the same thread in terms of readiness. Like we have the same program for the most part. So I won't be like too redundant about the details, but the things that are a little bit different with my setup is like, we've gotten it to the point where the only things that we need to pack for the trip are, is food and a cooler or clothes. And that's just about it, other than the the kit that you need for the associated adventure, right? So the deck system has been pretty awesome for us, to your earlier point. I, I get kind of frantic with my activities and get, like, head down into them. And, like, I hate cooking. Like, like, like that's, like, a secondary thing in, like, eating for, like, when especially when I'm hunting or fishing. So, like, whenever it comes to, like, those activities, I'm like, yeah, let's get this over with. I'm not, like, a big like eater on like when we're out camping. But one thing that has made that easier is the whole right side of my deck system is a kitchen. So up in the front is uh, a griddle style cooktop. I, I moved away from the Coleman stove style stuff because, you know, it does require like pans and pots and stuff like that where I just go full burner because I like cooking eggs and bacon and sausage yeah. and, and just wipe it up. And then all through the back of it, associated with priority of use, you'll have, um, one thing that I do is like, I have like a tackle box, like kind of thing, uh, with little containers with all these different seasonings in it. And that's a real nice way to keep things organized, screw tops. Yeah. And then you have the, like the big stuff at that, like the big containers at the house where you can refill them and then fold that up. And then, you know, the typical cutting board, your plates, whatever, all the cook stuff slides away and it's all done over with. Uh, but in terms of the stuff that we got to pack up again, thinking like from a priority perspective, like we keep our clothes towards the backside of the truck, like the tailgate, like our clean clothes so we can access them. And then what we use is like a six by six by four, six, 16, like kind of, um, packing cubes. Mm, okay. L- like if you're traveling. And we drop all of our, like, clothes in there, and they stick underneath the bed rail, like my wife and I. And it's, like, super dialed, out of the way. You know, you can change your clothes or whatever. And then we have a similar thing for dirty clothes, because that's always, like, an annoying thing whenever it you're is. camping. And that gets everywhere, and it's like, where do you put it? And it's all, like, super dialed over there. Um, you know, like, I'm not going to, like, kind of repeat all the stuff that Kurt said. It's the same stuff. We use the... uh the deck boxes for like our camp smalls, like all those random things like cards and bug spray and first aid kit right in the deck box drops into the left side. And then we generally keep about four foot of space for our 
associated adventure. You know, two nets, waders, boots, bags, fly rods, boom, shot it. And then that's it. Like we're on our way. So really all we have is like putting our food, putting our food together um, in a cooler. So, you know, like when you look at my setup, like when you, when you go and look inside to the left, there's like a goal zero and a camper uh, buddy heater. And then straight ahead above the cab of the truck is the bed system. So it's, it's all there ready to go. And to like reiterate the point for the third time, like I think the biggest complaint about camping is like there's so much stuff you have to get ready. Like my truck is pointed towards wherever we're going and ready to go, you know, just like throw the stuff in it, you know, your, your food. Yeah, no, that that that, so, that makes a lot of sense. And that that's what that's what makes it exciting is like you don't have to it doesn't have to be a big ordeal. No, and and honestly, it's fun to like be organized. It get, is. Like yeah. once you get that stuff dialed, I've learned it because I struggle with it, but like once I've learned how to to do that and the, even simple things like you're having a dirty bag with your clothes, like I do like that uh Mr. Ranch Mission yeah. Duffel that me and Kurt both have the front the front end has like a dirty bag thing that you slide into it and it takes up space in it. So as you remove clothes that you're wearing, they just go in and it filters in. And then sure. the backside has a boot boot side of it. And I've had that for a lot. Did you have it first? Yeah, I've, I've had it for probably seven or eight years now. Yeah. And I used it when I was flying for the Air Force a bunch traveling because it's water resistant and all that. So out in the flight line when we were flying, like rain, it was rain, it didn't matter and it works well for camp but if i have to throw it on a roof rack nothing's going to be soaked i don't want to do that but if i run yeah. out of space because i've filled everything up with meat or whatever hopefully i had a successful hunt but uh no and one thing too like this is with chris's setup and i can say this because i've camped with him a bunch because his stuff's so dialed in he's always he always has he's like the most fun person to camp with him and kate because they always have like they always bring something new to the table that's like it's like can jam, like something the can. last thing you'd want to think of. Staple. Or what's the what's the number one favorite camping tool that you bring out with you? I know it's my favorite, and I have one now that's in my car all the time. Camping tool? I guess camping entertainment. Slingshot. Oh, slingshot, yeah. Oh, yeah, for the people sure. playing can jam, if you're not on shoot deck, the, you're shooting shoot the, the frisbee. frisbee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got a piece yeah, of that. Yeah. Through this. May, maybe not as relevant for hunting. Tri- oh, that could it, be. Well, I mean, it's a quiet form of entertainment. Yeah, you're right. No, I killed a blue grouse with a slingshot. Did you? Yeah. Elk hunting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, quiet way to get some camp meat. Yeah, there's a grouse right above the tent, and I shot it with a slingshot. <laughs> I, yeah, worked out well. <laughs> right in the head. Oh, that's really funny. We'll, we'll put put a picture up. There we go. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll put proof Jamie, up. put put that up in the picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one other thing that uh, um, so like when it comes to like hunting gear, when it comes to whitetail hunting, you know, you're thinking about scent a little bit, and you're thinking about camping, and it's like, okay, how do you mitigate scent? And mm-hmm. there's not a great way for it, but like I do carry the dude wipes, the unscented dude wipes, and I wipe down with that. But as far as my clothes. Sika doesn't make it anymore, but they had that launch pad for a while. Do you know what I'm talking about, yeah. Chris? Yep. It like it held your bow in it, and it used the padding of your clothes as like the padding in it, and it folded up, and it had the thing that came out, so you get off your boots and step onto a nice clean pad and be able to do that. That's how I keep I keep my base layers in one pocket, mid layers in another, and then my pants in one other, and then my other outer layers, jackets in another pad, and I have that all together slide that into my truck bed and it's like i have that i pull it out and it um you know works works great from from that standpoint and i put those little uh you know those little pine cone wafers in there oh yeah you know what i mean you wear one on your hat with a pen no i (laughs) (laughs) I don't do that but i do put them in there because that's something like i felt like as a kid we did like you you always would you would you say that that is like the secret to success, a hundred percent. If you want to kill big whitetails, you and need for nine little... ninety nine, we will sell you. Yeah, maybe okay. you need the East meets West branded pine cone. Pine cone <laughs> that goes in. Who made that's Hunter H- Specialty? H S Strut, yeah, H yeah, S or H S Strut, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You'd, have, you'd, you'd have to stuff. go through. Yeah, the little brown case with the little. There's like four or five wafers that are Dude, in there. You get a you get a you get a, snor- a snort of that. 
That's straight deer season. They last dude. forever. That, you smell that for the first time. You're like, oh, what's on? Yeah, you know it's hunting season yeah. at that point. Down at the bottom of the bag. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the thing is, I never put them back in the case. They're always just scattered in my, my clothes bags. Yeah. And they still maintain the scent. <laughs> They're just, they're amazing. I'll say yeah, it's it for a, you know nine ninety five. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty dang good to be able to do that. But I I don't worry as much about like scent, especially if I'm on a trip and I'm um I'm not saying it doesn't matter because I I do think it matters. But it, at that point, you know, you're not spending now or at this point, you know, a cheap hotel is one hundred fifty bucks a night, and you're going through it to be able to camp and be kind of in the game now. There's different places like and not, I'm not going to get into all the regulations on camping, but certain places you can't stay. There's places like, you know, West Virginia, there's not a whole lot of campgrounds in a lot of the places that I'm hunting. And so it's hard to be able to do that. Luckily for me that I have now, now I have private land that I'm able to camp on and be able to stay on, but it's not, it's not as easy to be able to find that, but most yeah. places you can find campgrounds that you can, and if you don't have a big camper and need electrical hookups and all that stuff, you can pull off a national forest. You can pull off really anywhere. Right. Uh, two words that if you're going to go out or anywhere to camp in national forest that you need to learn, like Google searching to find camping spots, non-dispersed camping. That is like your, when you discover that, you realize there's so many more places to camp than what just shows up on the map. Because you'll see, like, you might see one campground at the end of this road, but then you, like, realize that it's legal to non-disperse camp. Like, this is if you're e-scouting, right? You might think that's the only place you can camp on that area, but you get out there or you Google it and it'll say this whole road is non-dispersed camping. That opens up, like, 20 miles of just pull off the side of the road and set up a camp. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. What about... um? Like, what about some other tools? Did, did, do you guys carry generators at all or anything like that to charge stuff or or just anything? Does that, any of that stuff kind of come into your mix? I run I run a Goal Zero. Okay. And, and the intent- like an inverter? Like a power inverter? Is that what it is or what? So the Goal Zero has a 12-volt and 110, so it inverts to, yeah. to 110. So you can... Uh, you can have a standard uh, USB cable, one ten cigarette lighter. So the the idea, like a lot of times with that, is just to be able to charge your cell phone. Um, you know, if you're working, or if you're doing, like in your case, maybe some video editing or whatever the case may be, um, just some minor electrical stuff, uh, electronic stuff. Do you like that Goal Zero one? Yeah, for our our current camper, it's great. The old one, we had a we had uh, two AGM batteries in series hooked up to solar. It was full blown setup, so you could run anything. But uh, you know, for weekend trips and short trips, the 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 Goal Zero is nice. Yeah, it works well. And then when you're driving, you can plug it into the truck and charge it up. So I mean, it works fine. Yeah, good enough. No, yeah, no, that's 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 good. I I'd been looking. I haven't bought. I don't have anything like that right now. But I was looking at. Man, I can't remember the company. I want to say it's something Jack. It's Jackery. Like Jackery. Yeah. The orange. I, I was looking there. They had uh, on Amazon, they had the Prime Day sale this summer, and I was like really looking at They had a couple hundred dollars off on them because they're not product. cheap. You no. know, you're looking at 1200 bucks or something for them. But for me, I, I'd really love to be able to go on a trip and be able to work remotely. Although everyone thinks I just hunt for a living. That's not the case. You know, as far as you got to do work and be able to have a computer and power that up and you know and charge all your batteries and do that and those looked really cool uh, it'd be a as, great solution for a, that. as an option yeah you know and i've also to get real techie and and you know 21st century is like i've looked at even like getting the mobile starlink or a cell booster or something that goes along with it so i can work yeah on the road and honestly not just for people like me anybody that works remote you can get away with like, say you go on an early season hunt and it's hot during the day, you know, if you're able to work remotely from a place and do that during the day and hunt in the evenings and the mornings, you know, if you have the ability to do that, I think that'd be a really cool option to be able to do it. Oh, and that's where I think like a travel trailer or something would be real nice too. <laughs> you know, Jason yeah. from Timber Ninja just bought a travel trailer that has like air conditioning and the pop out sides and like, it's like a toy hauler essentially. It's open space but it pops out for beds and everything on it and i'm like that's pretty sweet yeah yeah absolutely you can go all in just depends on what you want to want to spend on it sure um 
I don't have a generator, but I, I just real quick want to add, I do heavily rely on a uh, jump little jump start pack. One that you oh, can yeah. jump start your vehicle with, but also you can charge your phone. Because like, they're big batteries. You can jump start your vehicle, say, a dozen times with it, but then you can charge your phone like who knows how many times with it because it's such a big battery. But me having an older vehicle, like that's just gives me a little bit more insurance, especially you, when I'm you out know, by myself. You know, it's funny you say that because like by the time this comes out, I'd already been to Alaska and hopefully I'm still alive. But like the uh, Uncharted and there's a bunch of companies that make them, but they make those, they call it the Zeus and it's the portable battery pack that jump starts vehicles. But I looked at it, it's like, it'll charge your phone like 12 times. Mm-hmm. I was like, I'm taking three batteries in the back country, these portable chargers to get that where I could probably just take one big one yeah. and have that ability yeah. <laughs> to to be able to charge everything and probably save on weight too. And just not having all the different. And that, that never leaves my vehicle. That's, stays in there For all sure. the time yeah i have one i don't know what the brand is we when i was working in safety that was one of the things we bought as a christmas gift for everybody was uh cause, partially because i wanted one myself but it was you know like one emergency kit emergency battery jump start. jump start thing that that's that can charge your phone or do anything and i keep that in my vehicle and once a year i typically pull it out and charge it in case it like slowly drains yeah. or whatever and and um but that that yeah that's a that's a good option also i carry one of those Kurt, i think you have one too a goal zero you're the one that got me this goal zero lantern i don't oh. have i don't have a goal zero lantern but i have something similar did that, you buy me that for yeah me? i did okay and um but i was just gonna i was thinking about that because like the last time i used it was when the power went out for a day at our house a couple weeks ago and like i pulled that thing out and it was that's what we had for light for a whole night like Sweet. Work great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have and it go- charges off. Zero. Another thing, like, make sure everything that you're getting is, like, compatible with itself. So, like, that charges on a USB port. So all of your battery packs, if your battery dies on your lantern, guess what? Just plug it into your phone charger. Yeah. Or if you're, you're truck camping, so turn your car on for a little bit and charge it. Make sure you have enough gas, obviously. But little things like that, which, I mean, I don't know if we want to touch on fuel storage. Yeah, I mean we can. Yeah, that's but, pretty uh, pretty quick topic. Uh, don't put your fuel can inside your vehicle. I've done that, and that's <laughs> turned out bad. <laughs> oh yeah, because you're in an SUV. So yeah, so like I filled up my ve- my fuel can. I came from Pennsylvania, uh, did a road trip back, filled it up at like two thousand feet, got up to like twelve thousand feet to camp, and I was like, I was just smelling gas like fumes. I didn't keep it in there all the time. I just would put it in there to go to point A to point B. Right, I'm smelling fumes, so I get to the campsite unload everything and i'm like ah, i probably just need to vent my gas can <laughs> didn't take it out of the vehicle for some reason crack that lid and just it was like somebody was shooting a fire hose of gas inside the vehicle <laughs> it was so bad <laughs> i drove home that night because i was supposed to sleep in my vehicle that night so i drove home with every window down like the big one down in the back and everything yeah. drove home like an hour and a half with my head out the window because i was getting lightheaded <laughs> i was like <laughs> <laughs> I still don't think my brain's recovered from that one. <laughs> it's, yeah, that killed a couple. It killed brain a lot cells. of pills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that <laughs> that's that's so true. something. Put it on the outside of your vehicle. Yeah, or in a truck bed. Or in a truck bed. Yeah, yeah. I keep mine in my truck bed. Or now I raise. So I, I talking about those overhaul HD bars by Yakima that I have on the Diamondback. I raised up my tent more this year when I put this new one on enough that I can fit my gas can underneath it and basically secure it to the side walls of that or next to a cooler because before I'd have to put it in there. I was always, it never happened, but I was always worried about it spilling or like tipping over and covering the rest of your gear, your truck bed. So like having it stored outside, I just have one of the military surplus jerry cans essentially yeah. that are metal sure. that you can lock to yeah. anything or whatever and that that works nice so, so i i put extra fuel on that because you get in some places you're not as much whitetail hunting but more so when you're honestly even whitetail hunting like in west virginia where my lease is at and where i hunt you have a long ways to go to a gas station and you're driving all around up there for yeah. a couple of days and you're camping and it's like you go through fuel pretty good, especially in my, you know, Tommy Tundra with getting 12 miles a gallon with 35s on it. Like you go through fuel pretty quick. Having sure. an extra five gallon can gives you that peace of mind when you have one last day and you're at a quarter tank and you need to like, you want to get that last hunt in. 
to to be able to make it through to get back to the gas station or if you're just driving through the middle of nowhere wyoming and there's no gas stations yeah like like remember kurt when i was uh driving out to bear hunt and i came through wyoming and and i had the heavy chevy at that point and i i filled up at the last gas station i saw and i never saw another gas station until i was just about on e and i ended up having to go to an indian reservation to to get gas 65 mile an hour headwinds yeah yeah exactly watch your your gas gauge yeah i was getting like seven and a half miles per gallon dude you ran out of gas i ran out of gas once. did you (laughs) yeah down on raton pass new mexico (laughs) my my damn uh gas gauge looked like an rpm gauge it was just like (laughs) snowing on Uh, raton it was bad (laughs) we rode my wife and i were riding the back of a rancher's truck full of logs (laughs) <laughs> it's a story boy um, <laughs> it's that, funny that is hilarious save it for another time but yeah sure did do you want to talk water storage yeah because like i know that was one of those things that kind of blew my mind that's the other thing that was a key to my system and i know we all have similar systems but before the standard was Chris, you want any more sure the Absolutely. standard was uh buy a case of water before you go anywhere you know and now um go on amazon and for like I don't know how much, but you can get a seven gallon jug of like empty jug to fill up with water each time. And seven gallons will last you a really long time. But I think they're, when I bought mine, I think it was like 17 bucks. And we've used that for now six years, but it doesn't take up that much space. And filling that up before you go, like seven gallons should last a family a whole weekend, one person, probably five, six days. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I say that with, I'm washing my hands with that. I'm washing pan, pots and pans out, refilling yeah. my now jeans every day. Like, it's uh, very, very uh, beneficial to have that much water and to not have to worry about having water. Yeah. Yeah. And you're in with water storage. So I have two separate water containers. I have one that I bought that looks like a jerry can, but it's plastic, military surplus one. I bought that because it looked cool. It kind of looked like my gas can. But the problem with it is, it gets so heavy when you fill it up, and there's just a spigot on top. Trying to pour it into something like a Nalgene can be can be a little difficult. Oh, yeah. yeah. So then I went and bought a cheap one at Walmart that was just a plastic five- or six-gallon container that had a spigot on it. And you just pull it to the edge of your tailgate, and dr- I'm like, okay. Yeah. That, that was a lot nicer yeah. to be able yeah. to do. But I do take both those with me when I go on hunts. I fill them up. Even if I know there's water, it's just like having that backup because you can go days without food, but you can't go days without water. So yeah, I don't know the exact stats on that, but that's that's something that that I put a lot of emphasis with. And one thing that I think is a really cool tool that I have is um, Sawyer makes a filter that goes on to spigots. So I take it with me, especially when I'm going out west. A lot of times you can go to places where they'll let you fill up containers for horses. Yeah. Um, Like on the back of restaurants, there was a place in Colorado. That I saw people filling it up, and I asked. I was like, can you get water there? Like, yeah, we have a spigot back there for horses. You know, you can fill up your trailer. I'm like, okay. You know, I can fill up my jugs with clean water, knowing that you're filtering it by just screwing this thing on to a spigot, and it just runs into your water jug. Versus, yeah. And I, I keep that in my truck at all times. That's a that's a really it flows good. at a decent rate. Yeah, oh yeah, it flows like I, I'm not as fast. You have to as adjust the, the pressure would. back a little bit on the spigot to make not the yeah like yeah blow it out. Yeah, you don't want it. You don't want to rip know, it full bore yeah. it open, but it uh and know what kind of filter you have to know if 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 it's going to be in freezing conditions, if it's going to ruin the filter or not. Cause yeah, if you're keeping it in your vehicle. That I've ruined so many filters doing that. Yeah, I'm still running that original Catadyne pro uh i forget who makes it but that Catadine. Catadine. is that the brand yeah. yeah i thought that was the model so the hiker pro i guess hiker the model pro, yeah i'm still running that filter for everything I'll yeah when i used to have what was the original one that i had the, the platypus yeah those things every hunt i have to throw it away because they'd freeze and go my sawyer one knock on wood has been great as far as like i've had it where i forget to like throw it in my sleeping bag or keep it in my truck or something warm to insulate a little bit and it's still working great. Yeah, because, like, I've had some of the platypus ones just completely, like, break everything inside when they freeze up and they just won't flow. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, water's water's important. I was going to ask, this was a question I had in my mind all the way from a while back in this conversation, but what about um, uh, showers? Have you thought of, have you done anything with that? 
Penny yes. I roll dirty. I don't shower. So um, I can tell you my wife's hot on the subject. She definitely wants to upgrade to something that does. We never had we, we never had a camping setup that had a built in shower. Now there are some homemade jobs. I don't know if you guys have seen this where they're using like four to six inch black PVC pipe on the top of their yeah. vehicles. Use the sun to heat it up a little bit. Yeah, so like naturally the sun heats it up and then you just kinda hit it with like a air chuck, kinda like pressurize it type of deal. And then you kind of can have like an outdoor shower. Mm. Uh, so for, you know, probably like a Western hunting application, uh, that, that might be uh, the jam. But like when it comes to whitetail hunting, you know, generally it's colder out. Yeah. You're not wanting to shower outside. Like so like I'm like if I'm doing an extended weekend or a weekend type of hunt, whitetail hunting, I'm, I'm most likely like just like wiping down with your dude wipes or those clean freak wipes you know the scentless such stuff. such a good brand dude wipes dude wipes clean freak great brands like just there's just an unscented wipe but i'm gonna buy the dude wipes every time even if they cost a little more than the you know dollar general sure unscented wipes i don't know they just seem cooler yeah i but I, when it what i mean when it comes to whitetail hunt night i am one to shower you know fairly regularly like maybe every couple of Generally every day, but yeah. you know, if I'm staying in my truck, I could, you know, I I like to hit the shower. Maybe two days, I could do it in the truck or whatever. But I'm generally yeah. not doing a lot of truck camping, whitetail hunting for an extended period. Yeah, what what I've learned with so the trailer I'm getting built is going to have a shower built in with a spigot that has like a pump system on it and everything. So it's going to be a little bit over the top for having that. But the only time I hot water, no, okay, just, just to just, clean, just to clean up, just to clean up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what I've, what I've found is like in Montana last year when it was a hundred some degrees opening weekend hunting, like that's the time I want to shower. Yeah. Whitetail hunting. I, I have done seven day trips where it's, I haven't done any longer than seven days in like November cold weather, uh, where, you know, I wasn't really showering. But what I found is a lot of these small towns have laundry mats that have showers in them. Oh, yeah, yeah. So like I, I usually plan it to drive in every three days and go put the quarters in the machine it, the shower goes quick so you gotta you gotta you can't be just messing around in there you gotta make sure that you're <laughs> getting yeah. in and out yeah um we did that in idaho elk hunting actually yeah, use the laundromat showers a couple times and uh to be able to do that or i'll like break it up where like if i'm going on a, a seven eight day whitetail hunt i may even put like uh one day out of that where i go and get a hotel or a oh, motel sure. and shower because like it it does especially when you're cold like that's the biggest thing as far as like i'm not even worried about sand as much as it is it nice to have that and you can call me what you want for that but it's nice to have <laughs> oh dude when i'm when i'm white tail hunting i'm normally staying somewhere when it's cold you know like yeah. so i can shower up you know yeah but i don't i don't normally go long enough where i need a shower like three four Five days, I wet wipes are fine for me. Yeah, when I'm by myself, my and my wife doesn't hasn't complained yet, but she's pretty <laughs> tolerant. For from... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, it's it that that seems to help. But colder weather stuff like the wet wipes, but also like a lot of white tail hunting. I mean, you're, you can sweat a lot hiking in, especially if you're you know going into a place and you got some elevation gain. You're setting up your stand and you're doing the whole thing, but like. I don't know. I just, I try to like break it up a little bit. Like I did that in West Virginia one night, lot that last trip, which I was sick too. So it felt nice to be in a hotel room, but like I booked a hotel one night to be able to break it up. But I mean, that saved me 800 bucks. Now think of when you say that, it's like, okay, rooftop tank, you get, <laughs> you get, you're getting expensive. Like, don't you're think, get, you can't think too much about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can't think too much about the cost savings. It's probably not. In you the could long justify run. spending if you're doing it a lot. Yeah, you can justify it. In the long run, it's probably not a whole lot of cost savings. But it, it is fun to just because it's like really you're just justifying something you want. And you're going to buy anyways, and it's like, <laughs> should I spend two thousand dollars? I mean, I can save one hundred fifty dollars by spending this two thousand dollars right now, or in the case of rooftop tent or camper four to ten thousand dollars but yeah who knows i mean 150 dollars a night that adds up over time in 20 years i'll have paid that camper off in hotels <laughs> well but, but with the rooftop 10 thing i will say like that jeans brewed when i have the retail price on that 
is four thousand dollars, and I think it's the same thing with the the Go Fast Campers one. And I had that other tent for five years, so and it's still fine. Like I'm giving like Justin, uh, my camera guy, is going to be using it going forward, and he actually used it before. So it was someone else that was in the hunting industry that had it before, and he slept in it before I even got it, which was kind of a funny tale of events how that worked out and but and i didn't even know him at the time when i got it but they do last a while so you're able maybe you can justify the price but i wouldn't look at it as the only reason for yeah, doing that because if you're if you're really pinching coins you're probably gonna you know get a tent from walmart and throw it in the throw it up next to your truck and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that you you will find problems but yeah, you should get Mason on here to talk about his setup if you want to talk about pinching pennies. Oh yeah, <laughs> the yeah. guy who's like what six two, six three, and sleeps in the front seat of his truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and Mason, yeah, will kill anything that's out there. So yeah, it, it, none of this stuff is necessary. Yeah, we're just talking about our ideal setups for mixing comfort with with convenience. I guess really when it comes down to it. Sure, like we like currently, like we have some really nice setups. I mean, yeah, but. Where we started in this truck camping journey, like for me, it was Facebook Marketplace. And like, I guess for listeners that may be intrigued about this whole concept, it's like, dude, get on Facebook Marketplace. You can buy a cap, one that like kind of pops up and gives you the ability to kind of sit up straight. A perfect truck camper for like $400, you know, uh, that that's a great option or, you know, even some of these older model actual truck campers that slide into your truck, you can find for a thousand, two thousand dollars. They're older, but like Kate and I did, you know, you can fix them up and have a really nice rig for, I mean, anything. So, yeah. Um, and oh. but we, we kind of had a progression to where we're at today. I mean, like, you, you don't, it's you don't like have, you don't have anything. The, you don't, you don't start out by building a half a million dollar house like even people that have that like no. you know they start out in an apartment and you kind of go through this this realm yeah. four-wheel camper the the product that i use uh it's expensive yeah and and, and it was kind of a major progression but i really enjoy seeing the people that are doing the diy stuff like 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 we like i did you know yeah. like that, that's the cooler stuff to me honestly is like the like how you did when you remodeled it during covid yeah like that, that. that that's sweet I, I like seeing those people that are taking those enclosed trailers and like modding them out. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's totally. there's quite a few people. Um a guy I had on the podcast um not long ago, Paul, he he was one that he just built something up and he just he's really good with welding and does that kind of stuff for a living and just like built this freaking sweet setup that would probably cost him thirty thousand dollars. He bought it off a shelf and I don't know what he has into it, but not nearly that much, you know. See like get creative right yeah now. like that that's awesome and i mean like how we kind of build our our system and what i'll recommend for people is like just to get started pick one aspect of it and get it perfect like we did that with our can our cook setup when we were in colorado so four or five years ago we got it so good that now i mean the last couple of years we haven't had to buy a single thing for our cook setup like obviously replace seasonings and stuff like that but like pots and pans we had dialed in all of that so focus on one little aspect that'll translate to someday when you can afford one of those nicer toppers for your truck or whatever all the stuff you already have works perfectly you know and it just plug and play yeah make it work across the board yep no that's 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 a good point like you know like looking at my setup like it's definitely it's it's higher in price and not probably not for wheel camper style, but you know, diamondback's not cheap, but again, it all depends on where you're at and what you're looking to do. Like the diamondback is super great for everyday life, hunting, fishing, all that different stuff, keeping your stuff secure. That was one thing I go to a lot of places. I sleep in some sketchy places. Sometimes I want my stuff secured under there. That's how, you know, that's why I wanted something that looked like that, is that style and then the rooftop tent it was like okay through the progression of things is like i want something comfortable that has a sleeping pad that's already in there that i'm off the ground i don't have any bears climbing up there very often yeah i mean you can it's important to note that you can do this on any budget yeah like you can my again i'll come back to my setup but it's like i could take anybody any of your listeners vehicles i don't care if they're driving a toyota corolla around 
my system will fit in there and they could do exactly what I'm doing. Yo, I had a Toyota Corolla once, five speed <laughs> manual transmission. Shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty cool. But uh the yeah, but then the mice built a nest in the cabin air filter and every time I turned the heat on I got that. I get a headache, aroma. you know. Yeah. I get that aroma, and didn't realize that there was even a cabin air filter. Sorry, did I say aroma? I meant ammonia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, n- nonetheless, you're right. Like you, you can modify anything to go from having being flat broke to being able to sleep out of a vehicle to having, you know, making a million dollars a year and have a pretty sick setup. Like I believe me, I'd love to have everything that's out there. My system is nowhere near that, but I built it over time. And, you know, over the last, well, 10 years since I've been traveling to hunt and do these things and camp and like, I've, some of the pieces I have are 10, 12 years old. And then other things are, you know, I bought this year, but it's like, it comes through a progression in time and you figure out what you value and what, what makes sense for that occasion. Like I love, dirt bagging it back country back hunt you know diy high country back country hunt throwing all the keywords in there like i love doing that but like i also like to be a little bit comfortable sometimes and i like and heavy doing that. canvas wall tents is what i like <laughs> And yeah. go having said that i am doing a backpack hunt i love backpacking and all that but uh, oh yeah i mean i i have a, i guess i have a question for both of you chris i'll, I'll go to you first on this but because these systems are like it's no fun unless you're making them better each time how do you uh track your i guess evolve evolving your camping system because me personally i keep notes on my phone like every time i'm out like this is what i want to change it's i might i might not be able to afford it at that time but i have it for later but how do you do it or what he does he sells me stuff so then he can afford yeah i sell both stuff stuff. the the stuff that i don't at retail like (laughs) (laughs) no it's absolutely no different than you uh my wife and i kind of debrief after we're done camping and we're like grocery you know gear like we might be out of batteries and something or yeah you know various things but we have we kind of have a running truck camping and i'd be lost without my wife honestly i mean she 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 has me so she has that thing so dialed in. When it comes to hunting season, I'm just a lucky guy. Yeah, because the thing's so set up, you know. <laughs> so she like for her to be comfortable in the situation. Um, not to say she's not tough, but like she she enjoys a nice camp setup, and man, she's made it so nice. But Andrew, I'll make sure Kate listens to this because that's that's pretty good, you know. Dude, I'm I'm not lying. She's 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 a I'm, I'm a rock star. I'm, I'm a lucky guy to have somebody that wants to do that stuff, you know. Me, yeah, me yeah. as well. Yeah, I'll say when I'm when I'm camping with Abby, there's a definite difference in what my diet looks like when she's there and when it's just me. When she's there, it's like really nice meals, and when I'm there, it's like you're lucky if you got whiskey. Yeah, I got whiskey and hot dogs. <laughs> it's like when we're roll- I forgot the buns. It's just, <laughs> but I got a pan to cook it in because I had my cook set up right. <laughs> yeah no i i <laughs> yeah I, I i can understand that but it's like it, again it, it comes down to what you're looking for what you're looking out of it and well, where you're going all those types of things if you're mostly whitetail hunting maybe some of the stuff that we talked about isn't as important or maybe more of it is like uh, i just on cold weather hunts having some sort of warmth helps and and honestly that can be sometimes just the truck enough of like driving back to your camping spot like yeah. that's that's one thing i learned when i was in west virginia was i was like so set on having the stove because it was going to be around freezing and you know it's going to get cold but just me getting in the truck and driving back to my camping spot enough got me warmed up and feeling good enough and you might sit in the truck for a little extra maybe throw a little music on you know make yourself feel good maybe some like real sad country and when you're not having a good day (laughs) but you you get through that and then you know and then you have if you have a good sleeping bag and stuff that keep you warm and wear your clothes you know like i i mean that's what comes down to a good layering system like I wear my clothes to bed. Like I don't strip down and throw on my PJs that, you know, that I'd wear normally. And I I don't really wear clothes to bed, but, um, like I wouldn't throw a set of PJs on or separate set of clothes. Like I just jump in with my gear that, that I spent this money on or like that, that you spent this money on and you have like 
use that stuff to all work together and in this system and being able to do it but it allows you to go to some really cool places and uh man i freaking loved i love truck camping like that's my favorite style of of hunting because it does mix a little bit of convenience and having a little bit of those securities with still camping and getting to experience wild places oh yeah while being extremely mobile Yes. While being extremely mobile. I'm looking forward to applying what I've learned out west, camping out west, and doing it out here in the east. Like wall tent setups, you don't hear a lot of people doing wall tents, and I might find out why you don't hear that. But I'm looking forward to Don't don't burn hemlocks or pine branches in your uh, wood stove. Remember that, Kurt? (laughs) Yeah, I remember that. I don't think I'll have that issue with mine because I don't have a... uh, Actually, I actually do have a damper on mine. Yeah. But... uh, no, I do. do you want do you want to elaborate on that? What happened? I don't remember if I ever told that on the podcast you did. before. You told did it on I? the last one that I was on with you did about I? the the <laughs> piping. I'm glad you remember. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, yeah. To watch what you're burning. Make sure it's burning clean or burning hot enough. We were burning wet hemlock, and it clogged up the. Uh, so that was a spark arrester. A yeah, spark arrester. So it, like a wire screen that kind of clogged up with soot and everything. Creosote. Yeah. Creosote. Creosote. Yeah. Yep. But if you have a damper, you shouldn't have that issue. Yeah. I clogged Chris, I clogged up Chris so when Kurt and I were camping. We see which is a puppy. Oh yeah, back I just filled the tent with smoke. Yeah. And I, I can sleep through a hurricane. So I'm sleeping choking and Kurt wakes me up like we gotta get out of the tent. And uh, it's like <laughs> I just <laughs> I look at Sage and she's like glued to the bottom of the <laughs> She's all under t- the smoke line. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm sitting there choking like I probably would have died in there because I was just burning all this wet hemlock and it was just like plugging. It plugged up the pipe almost solid. Yeah, you got to be careful, man. You can't do that. <clears throat> Same thing with the buddy heaters, you know. Obviously, anybody that's truck camping, make sure you're being safe about it because carbon monoxide poisoning, right? So make sure you have cross ventilation or, you know, don't sleep with it on. You know? Yeah. Like that's what I do is like I cut the chill in the yeah. evening, get in bed, and then you can reach over, shut it off. Vent a you... window, and then have that, and then shut it off before you go to bed. Yeah, and when you wake up in the morning, even more important, you're, you know, frozen solid or whatever. Well, not really, but it's cold out. You don't you don't want to get out, right? So you just kick that heater on, heat up the space, then you're good to go. Yeah. My but... uh, my little buddy heater that I, not I guess it is a buddy heater. It's one of the ones you flip up, and it's a cook, cooking surface, too. But uh, I use it for ice fishing. Yeah. But... It heats our wall tent. We found that if it's not going to get below 40 degrees, that's all we need. We don't need a wood stove. Just cut the chill. Yeah, it just cuts the chill. And that breathable canvas, we'll actually set it up underneath the wood stove vent so it has a little bit of air. We don't leave it on all night either. But, yeah, it's pretty nice warmth, yeah. heat. Yeah. Well, do you guys think there's anything else you want to add? or No, uh, I, I'll emphasize one more time, please make your stuff easy to pack because then you'll camp a hell of a lot more like even to our level in colorado we lived in this really small condo and we had a storage thing down in our in our like joint garage that we shared with people and if we would have kept all of our camping stuff down there we would have not went as much as we did instead we sent up a dog we set up a dog crate underneath the stairs in the living room covered it with a blanket and all of our cooking stuff fit in that dog crate so that it was like hand it to the next person out the door and it was going in the vehicle but doing that you're going to do it a hell of a lot more so that's that's my advice build a system have it quick to pack chris anything else you want to leave the listeners with no i think we covered the key elements i think you know storage heat sleeping system and general organization like that that's really what you want to focus on we, we covered it pretty well Cool. I, I don't have anything else. I think we uh, we baked it pretty well. Cool. Well, if you uh, want to check out Kurt's stuff, as he's been on here before, but at Kurt underscore the underscore gunsmith on Instagram, his website, KurtTheGunsmith.com. Sign up for his email subscriber list there so you get some stuff you want to learn about rifles and guns yeah. and cool stuff that he finds information that's not on the Internet by reading old books because he's a nerd. Um also works for Spartan Forge doing the research stuff there. So if you have anything to bitch about there, I would recommend reaching out to Kurt. Bill Thompson. <laughs> yeah. Reaching out to Bill, Bill Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Chris Toomey Official on Instagram. Chris has some cool stuff up there and everything. Um, 
been a it's been a pleasure to get to camp with you guys on some of these trips and do that and i'm pumped that both you guys are back in pennsylvania now we can spend more time together chris i expect to see you up at our camp which i don't know if you've experienced our camp before our deer camp just a tour i, I, gave I haven't tour. seen it are you giving a tour Gave a tour yeah, a lot you gotta of come up here. you gotta give it you gotta come up during hunting season and hang out with the the vibe of it and preferably during one of the weeks of the rut so you can see the energy that is bucks uh, coming in yeah, yeah i haven't i haven't seen it in its proper element so I'll yeah be, i'll gotta, be up in a couple months yeah you gotta do that and then um and then also johnny's camp i'm sure you'll be there in johnny's new hot tub that he built so we could look at the deer hanging. i'll be there tonight <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah you're staying at johnny's tonight aren't yeah, you yeah 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 so that, that'd be great but anything else you guys want to leave it with or is that about it i think that's it no it's good catching up, though. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for guys. having us. I appreciate you coming up and chatting. Broadcasting live from the East Meets West headquarters. Headquarters this here. The and No, I've done. I did one with Johnny and my dad from right here. That'll okay. come out before this. So oh, you guys are second. Second. Okay. Yeah. First one at night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, thanks guys. Both. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.